Frederick Bailey Deeming, born in Leicestershire, England, was the son of Thomas Deeming, a brazier, and Anne. Described as a difficult child, Deeming embarked on a rebellious path at the age of 16 when he ran away to sea. This marked the beginning of a prolonged criminal career, primarily involved in theft and obtaining money through deceit. Following his arrest in 1892, police investigations uncovered Deeming's migration to Australia in 1882, primarily residing and working in Sydney. During his time in Australia, Deeming worked for a Sydney gas fitter and faced charges for stealing brass fittings from his employer. Despite vehemently denying the theft, the stolen items were discovered at his residence, leading to a six-week imprisonment sentence. Deeming dramatically faked a faint when the sentence was pronounced. Upon release, he continued working as a gas fitter in Sydney until December 1887 when he faced trial for fraudulent insolvency. While out on bail, he disappeared from New South Wales. Throughout his stay in Australia, Deeming was accompanied by his wife, Marie, described as a typical Welsh lass. They had married in Lower Tranmere, England in February 1881, briefly residing in Birkenhead before relocating to Melbourne. Deeming's brother, Alfred, had married Marie's sister, Martha. By 1886, Deeming and Marie had two Australian-born daughters, Bertha and Marie. In 1888, Deeming's brothers, Alfred and Walter, learned of his plans to return to England with what was believed to be a substantial fortune. Subsequent police and newspaper investigations uncovered Deeming's activities in Cape Town, South Africa during 1888 and 1889. However, the precise details of his movements during this period remain unclear, and there are indications that he returned to Birkenhead, England, at least once. It was during this time that Marie, his wife, had another child. In 1889, Deeming was identified as being involved in a fraudulent scheme related to a Transville diamond mine. His return to England aboard the steamship Yumna left a lasting impression on the captain and passengers due to his extravagant display of jewelry and money coupled with unwanted attention towards some female passengers. By November of 1889, Deeming had arrived in Hull and was residing in the nearby town of Beverly. Posing as a retired sheep farmer named Harry Lawson from Mount House Farm, Queensland, claiming to live on an annual income of 1,500 pounds, he successfully courted and bigamously married Helen Madsen, the 21-year-old daughter of his landlady, on February 18, 1890. Approximately a month later, after a honeymoon in the south of England, he abruptly vanished, taking with him the costly gifts he had given to Matheson. Deeming's first wife and extended family learned of his bigamous marriage to Matheson. Subsequently, Deeming was discovered to have visited Marie and his now four children in Birkenhead, where he reportedly gave Marie a substantial sum of money. He announced his departure to South America, promising to send for her and the children once he was settled. Before leaving, he engaged in another fraudulent act at a jeweler's in Hull. Upon arriving in Montevideo, he was arrested for this offense and extradited back to England, facing a charge of obtaining goods by false pretenses and ultimately receiving a nine-month prison sentence. Upon his release from prison in July of 1891, Deeming proceeded to the Liverpool area, where he settled in a hotel in the village of Rainhill, Merseyside, assuming the alias Albert Williams. A mysterious woman, likely his wife Marie, made an appearance at the hotel, but was dismissed as his sister, supposedly visiting before her departure to Port Said. Deeming then secured a lease for Denham Villa, a residence in Rainhill, ostensibly on behalf of a military acquaintance known as Colonel Brooks. Contrary to this arrangement, Deeming himself took up residence at Denham Villa with a woman and several children, observed at the house being casually dismissed as his sister and her children visiting who had supposedly since returned home. Following this, Deeming raised concerns about defective drains in Denham Villa and the need to replace the kitchen floor, closely overseeing the renovation work. During his time in Rainhill, Deeming initiated a courtship with Emily Lydia Mather, the daughter of a widowed local shopkeeper, Mrs. Dove Mather. Under the guise of Albert Williams, Deeming and Mather were united in marriage on September 22, 1891. In November of 1891, still utilizing the alias Williams, Deeming transported Mather to Australia aboard the German steamship Kaiser Wilhelm II. 
They reached Melbourne on December 15, 1891, and Deeming rented a house on Andrew Street in Windsor, a suburb of Melbourne. Tragically, on either December 24th or early December 25th, 1891, he committed the heinous act of murdering Mather and concealing her remains beneath the hearthstone in one of the bedrooms, meticulously covering the body with cement. Deeming had paid a month's rent in advance using the name Mr. Droon, but promptly vacated the premises. The property's owner, local butcher John Stamford, had initially been content to lease to Deeming due to his outward appearance of respectability, initially unaware of the man's true identity. On March 3, 1892, a potential tenant of the Windsor residence reported a disagreeable smell emanating from the second bedroom. The owner and estate agent, upon lifting the hearthstone to investigate, were overwhelmed by an overpowering odor, prompting them to call the police. The discovery of Mather's lifeless body ensued. A postmortem examination on March 4th revealed that while her skull had sustained multiple fractures from severe blows, the most likely cause of death was a slashed throat. Examining clues left at the vacant Andrew Street residence and gathering information from local tradespeople, including Stanford, his agent, a laundress, an ironmonger who supplied deeming with cement, and several carriers, Victoria Police Sergeant William Considine and Henry Causey successfully traced the recently departed Mr. Williams back to the Kaiser Wilhelm II. Interviews with fellow passengers corroborated descriptions of both Mr. Williams and Mather. During the sea voyage, Mather had spoken to others about her family in Rainhill, establishing the crucial connection. Deeming's conduct as Mr. Williams had drawn significant attention during the journey, with passengers expressing a collective disdain for him while acknowledging his seemingly affectionate and considerate treatment of his wife. Despite the circulated detailed description of Mr. Williams shared with the Australian colonies, his true identity remained unknown at this stage. An inquest on March 8th revealed that a man matching Mr. Williams' description had auctioned various household goods, possibly wedding presents, in the city in early January of 1892. During this time, he was registered at the Cathedral Hotel in Swanston Street, Melbourne, under the name Mr. Duncan. Subsequently, it was discovered that Deeming, posing as Albert Williams, had penned an affectionate letter to Mather's mother just days after her daughter's murder. Deeming also found time under the alias Duncan to approach Holt's matrimony agency, expressing a desire to meet a young lady with matrimonial intentions. Additionally, he engaged in a fraudulent scheme targeting a local Melbourne jeweler. Around January 12, 1892, Deeming traveled from Sydney, adopting the alias Baron Swanston, during the voyage and his time in Sydney, Deeming met and courted Kate Rounsfell. He assured Rounsfell that marrying him would be a decision she'd never regret, promising perpetual happiness in matrimony with him. After a whirlwind romance marked by Deeming gifting Rounsfell stolen Melbourne jewelry, she agreed to marry Baron Swanston. Despite her willingness to follow him to Western Australia, Rounsfell and Deeming eventually went their separate ways. Deeming had secured a position at a mine in Southern Cross through forged testimonials. On January 22, 1892, Baron Swanston set sail for Fremantle, where Deeming, once again assuming this persona, regaled fellow passengers with tales of his wealth and social standing. During the voyage, he made advances toward Miss Maud Beach, who was under the care of her uncle and aunt, Mr. and Mrs. Wakeley. In this instance, Deeming's charm failed as Mr. Wakeley bluntly expressed his skepticism and refused to let a man of Deeming's supposed class enter his family circle. Despite this setback, Deeming persisted with pleas to Runsfeld after settling in Southern Cross, urging her not to keep him waiting. However, the police were closing in. Following telegrams from Victoria Police to Western Australia, Deeming was arrested at Southern Cross on March 12, 1892. Initially denying his true identity, he later mentioned, I think I know the party who has been murdered. I don't believe anyone would have the heart to murder a girl like that. Found in his possession were several belongings of Mather, including her prayer book. Simultaneously, news of the Rainhill murders in England reached Australia. Following widespread attention to the discovery of Mather's body in Windsor, further investigations at Rainhill unveiled the grim truth of the situation. The decomposing bodies of Marie Deeming and her four children, Bertha, age 10, 
Mary, age 7, Sydney, age 5, and Leela, aged 18 months, were found buried beneath the re-concreted floor in Denham Villa. Most of the victims had their throats cut, with Bertha having been strangled. These horrific murders and burials had taken place around July 26, 1891, while Deeming, assuming the identity of Albert Williams, was actively courting Mather. During an inquest held at Rainhill on March 18, 1892, Deeming's brothers identified Murray and provided some details about his activities. Shockingly, the Rainhill murders had gone unnoticed for eight months. Deeming's brothers and Murray's sister had been led to believe that Murray and the children were enjoying a holiday in Brighton, and later they assumed they were overseas again. Deeming had made multiple visits to Birkenhead to reassure Martha, Murray's sister, about the well-being of her sister and the children. The detection of these heinous crimes was further hindered by Deeming's lease using the alias Williams on Denham Villa. The lease specified that the house could not be sold or rented for six months due to the anticipated arrival of Colonel Brooks and or Williams' sister. Additionally, the lease granted Williams permission to resurface the concrete floor, adding another layer to the obstruction of the investigation. Indignant protests against Deeming erupted during the journey to Perth and later on the route to Albany. Deeming faced trial at the Melbourne Supreme Court on April 25, 1892, with the prosecution led by Robert Walsh. Alfred Deakin, who would later become Prime Minister of Australia, served as Deeming's counsel and attempted to present a plea of insanity. The defense also questioned the potential influence of newspaper reportings on the jury. In an effort to support the insanity defense, Deeming claimed to have contracted syphilis in London and asserted that he received visitations from his deceased mother's spirit guiding his actions. Prior to the jury's deliberation, Deeming delivered a lengthy and disjointed self-justifying speech. He reiterated the narrative that he had shared with the police, suggesting that Emily had run off with another man, finding solace in the belief that she was not deceased. Despite his efforts, Deeming was found guilty and charged. In his final days, he engaged in writing his autobiography and poetry, expressing, The jury listened well to the yarn I had to tell, but they sent me straight to hell. Deeming also reportedly confessed to Church of England ministers. Deeming was executed at 10.01 a.m. on May 23, 1892, weighing 143 pounds, 14 pounds less than when he entered prison. Regrettably, the autobiography he had written in jail was destroyed. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing by clicking the red subscribe button below. And don't forget to ring that notification bell so you never miss an update. Your support means the world to us. Please give this video a thumbs up if you liked it. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.